Hello and welcome to today's talk, Sunday the 19th of November. Now researchers from Yale in the United States have identified a post-vaccine syndrome occurring after the COVID vaccinations. Post-after syndrome describes a group of clinical features. So like AIDS, for example, is acquired immune deficiency syndrome. It's not just one symptom. It can affect the brain. It can affect the, the lungs. It can affect various parts of the body because it's a syndrome. And it's the same with this post-vaccine syndrome, a range of possible presentations. Now, the most common ones are uh, post-vaccine syndrome, most common symptom described by the participants, exercise intolerance. 71% had exercise intolerance. Now, of course, the heart is essential to maintain cardiac output, to circulate the blood around the body. If the heart is not working properly, people will feel tired and be unable to exercise. We don't know if that's the case here. We just know that exercise intolerance was complained of by 71% of participants. Excessive fatigue, 69%. Now, excessive fatigue could be the cardiovascular system, could be the respiratory system, could be the central nervous system. We don't really know that. We just know that 69% complained of excessive fatigue. 63% complained of numbness. That's very likely to be a peripheral nervous system disorder, different parts of the body being numb. Brain fog was 63%, so cloudy head, not being able to think clearly. Could be neurological, could be due to the blood supply to the brain, could be due to the way the brain uses nutrients and oxygen. Wide variety of causes, but 63% reported brain fog. And 63% also reported neuropathy. Neuropathy just means disease of the nerves. It doesn't tell us much detail, but it tells us disease of the nerves. 63% reported that. And also in the week before, and this is a couple of years, this is, this is quite a long time after vaccine, a year or more. Um, a lot of people in the week before were still complaining of anxiety and depression related symptoms. And I don't know about your experience, but um, a lot of people have been reporting anxiety and depression to me. Um, let me know if, if that's the case for you. Is there more anxiety and depression in the world now than there was, say, in, in 2019? Interesting question. Anyway, let's go straight on and look at the detail of this paper now. That's what this is about. Do stick around. It is really quite remarkably interesting. This is the paper here now. Um, we'll look at the uh, a little bit about the people that wrote the paper and uh, the likely validity of this paper, but it's all there um, and it's it's remarkably um, easy to read for a medical paper. I must say, very very straightforward to read. You could read this in half an hour, 40, 40 minutes easily. You could read it quite quite uh, quite comprehensively. So descriptive analysis uh, of reported symptoms of patients' experience, experiences after COVID-19 immunisation. Now, this is the Yale Listen to Immune Symptom and Treatment Experiences Now study. And uh, let's, let's just take a moment to agree with this wholeheartedly. It's about time we listened to what people are saying. If a patient is describing their symptoms to me, and I don't listen, then that's a fundamental failure of my duty as a healthcare professional, as far as I'm concerned. For example, we talk, I taught student nurses about pain for, for, for getting on for 30 years. Well, it would be 30 years, really. Anyway, we, we always said that pain is what the patient says it is, existing when they say it does. We have to listen to our patients. Most of the information we get about a medical examination is from the history, is what the patient tells us. We get a little bit from blood tests and other things like that, but most of it is from what the patient tells us. We have to listen. We haven't been good at listening. That has to change. If people are complaining of symptoms, we have to listen to them and take it seriously, not poo-poo it as some psychiatric disorder, which all of a sudden seems to be a common around the world. I don't think so. Anyway, um, that's the study. Um, now, this is a preprint paper, so it's not peer reviewed, but um, it's quite reputable areas. So we've got Centre for uh, Outcomes Research and Evaluation, Yale uh, Centre for Immu Infection and Immunity, Yale School of uh, Medicine, 
a section of cardiovascular medicine, applied mathematics, uh, medicine, University of Toronto. It's all pretty mainstream academics, uh, Chicago. Um, so although this isn't peer reviewed yet, I've read it and, and really it would be pretty hard to get the maths wrong on this. So I, tr I strongly suspect that this data is accurately representing what these people reported and would expect to see this in peer-reviewed publications uh, pretty soon. I would imagine it'd be fairly straightforward to get that uh, published and it will happen, but we want to report it as soon as we can. Right, introduction, a chronic post-vaccine syndrome, PVS, after COVID vaccine has been reported but has yet to be well characterised. But we're characterising it now, post-vaccine syndrome. So chronic syndrome with symptoms that began soon after vaccination is how they are defining this, which makes perfect sense. That's a very logical way to describe this. Now, the method they used, and this is people who joined the study, May 2022 to July 2023, 241 individuals reported, which is quite a good number for this sort of semi qualitative study describing the number of um, uh, the, the, the type of symptoms that people are suffering from, mostly from the United States. Now, I will be putting a link at the end of this. I think it looks like you can join this from anywhere in the world. So so that, that's in the description uh, underneath. But we'll mention that in a minute. Patients 18 year, years and older um, who self-reported post-vaccine syndrome after, post -vac after COVID uh, vaccination. And they also did deep immune profiling is used for some individuals. So some people, they just listen to their symptoms and others, they did deep immune profiling. So looking at the white blood cells, the different types of white blood cells, the, the chemicals given off by these white blood cells, a, a thorough analysis of the, uh, the, the, uh, the blood cells responsible for immunity. So th there was this biological aspect uh, as well. Now, the results, uh, median age was 46 among participants with post-vaccine syndrome. 55% uh, had received the Pfizer, 86% had received the Moderna. They're the only ones that are mentioned. Johnson & Johnson was given for a time in the States, of course, as well. Um, so um, Pfizer mostly, but Moderna also. Um, now, time from index vaccination, first vaccine, to uh, uh, symptom onset. Median time was three days, but it varied. But well, interquartile range, that's 50% of the participants who responded was between one and eight days. But the thing is, some of these features seem to go on for an awful long time. Now, when these um, this line of um, treatment first came out, it was very hard to conceptualise that there would be such potential long-term issues. That's really been quite a surprise and a major uh, disappointment. In fact, it's quite concerning really um, as, as many of you uh, sadly uh, know from personal experience. Um, time, uh, time from vaccination to symptom survey completion. So that was when the symptoms often typically began just short af after the vaccine but we're going on for a long long time here. So the time from a vaccination to symptom survey completion uh, the average time here was 595 days into quartile range, 50% lying between 417 and 661 days. This is a long time post-vaccine. And th this is a quality of life uh, survey here, this quality of life analogue scale looking at various parameters. And they found it was 50. So what, what this scale does, um, you would say um, zero is terrible, 100 is good. So you can see a lot of these people aren't doing very well on quite a few quality of life parameters, which is pretty... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's very, it's very sad and terrible for the individuals. Five most common symptoms, as we've said: exercise intolerance, seventy-one percent; exercise fatigue, sixty-nine percent; numbness, sixty-three percent; brain fog; neuropathy, sixty-three percent. Now, this is perhaps, I think you could almost say, equally concerning. Really, in the week uh, before the survey was completed, people were asked to give their experiences and um, the people in who reported had experienced these at least once in the week before they um, filled out the, uh, the questionnaire. Feeling uneasy, 93%, at least once in the week. Fearfulness, 
uh, the anxiety that we're talking about, 82%. Overwhelmed by worries, 81%. Feeling of helplessness, 80%. Anxiety, 76%. Depression, 76%. Hopelessness, 72%. Of course, you can see that these percentages are so high that many people are suffering from more than one. And um, feelings of worthlessness, 49% experience those. And there are also concerns related to living situations, food security and uh, accommodation. So we see that this post-vaccine syndrome is being reported by these participants to affect many aspects of life, these medical aspects these uh, psychological stroke, psychiatric aspects and their ability to just provide for themselves normally in the world. Um, So I'll put those uh, in the description. They're all listed there. Um, All totally horrible, uh, horrible features. Uh, So the people filling out these experience those at least once in the week. Now, symptom severity, when asked to uh, quantify their symptoms, um, not from uh, trivial to 100 unbearable, participants reported that the worst symptom uh, was uh, 80. So pretty bad, 8 out of 10 for severity on their worst days. Good days, bad days, but on the worst days, 80 out of 100. Severe, I would call that quite severe. Now, they've tried various interventions, these individuals. Uh, In fact, they reported a median of 20 uh, interventions, 20 things that people have tried. So I think this talks about desperation, really. They've tried 20 different things to try and alleviate their symptoms. Because... There's no standard treatment. We, we, this is partly what this study wants to do. We need to standardise the treatment for individuals with post-vaccine syndrome. But anyway, let's look at some of the things that they had tried. Um, oral steroids, anti-inflammatory, very powerful anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, 48% had tried that. Gabapentin, which is usually used for peripheral nerve conditions. Uh, 25% had tried that. Low-dose naltrexone, 20% had tried that. Drug beginning with I, uh, 44, 18% had tried that. Propanolol, beta blocker, 11%. Bronchodilators to dilate the respiratory passages, 11% had tried that. So it looks like they're people's... Do- now, of course, the stu- we, we are not saying, and the study is not saying that any of these are efficacious. Not at all. No one is advising any treatments here. They're just simply reporting that this is what people have tried to relieve their symptoms. These are what people have reported that they have tried. This is part of the problem. We, we, we need a database for what is effective so that doctors can prescribe effectively. Um, more than 500 additional treatments were reported by participants. Again, I think, I think this is just showing desperation. People were trying many different things, limiting exercise or exertion, quitting alcohol or caffeine, hydration and increased salt intake, intermittent fasting. Again, no discussion that these are effective or ineffective. It's just reporting what people had tried. Now, the conclusion of the study. Um, In this this study, individuals who reported post-vaccine syndrome after COVID-19 vaccination had low health status. Low health status not what we want remember the median age here was only 46 was it 46 i'm pretty sure it was 46 was the the median age uh anyway yeah i'm pretty sure it was 46 yeah 46 so we're dealing with relatively young people here much of the time with low health status this is not the way it should be the middle years of life should be for the most part Healthy, for the most part, for most of us. High symptom burden, we're complaining a lot of symptoms. High psychological stress. Of course, if there's something wrong with you, and especially a chronic disease, that does lead to anxiety and depression. Or 
that could be an, an intrinsic part of the syndrome that people get anxiety and depression. So it could be like a primary manifestation of the syndrome, or it could be secondary to all the other things that are going on. Either way, it's horrible and distressing for the uh, individual. Despite trying many treatments, and then the paper says there's a need for continued investigation uh, to understand and treat this condition. Absolutely, there is. We agree absolutely, totally, completely with that. This needs to get into mainstream medicine. Now, finally, I haven't checked this out myself, but uh, this is the um, this is the way that the study was um, completed through Kindred. I think you can probably join this. I haven't tried it, but I think you can do it. Uh, Kindred is a community of patients working with researchers to power more useful, uh, impactful progress. And there are the links there if you want to check that out. Uh, I'd probably be able to report your symptoms on there. Um, obvious questions is um, why hasn't this data been published by um, the bodies that are supposed to monitor this sort of thing, yellow card system in the UK, VAERS in the United States. Uh, why aren't we getting papers from the, the CDC and the, the, the health service in the UK? But these people at Yale are listening. And uh, maybe we should just close with that. If, if someone is suffering from something, whether it's physical or psychological, listen to them. Re refer them on to professionals as well, of course. Um, but if someone says, look, tell you the truth, John, whatever, whatever, whatever you, your name is, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not feeling that good today. I'm feeling like being anxious today. Then listen to that because just, just to, for someone to say that might require quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of courage for them to say that. You know, if someone's a bit depressed and they say, look, 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 uh, Joan, I'm a bit, I'm a bit down today. It's probably taken a lot of courage for them to say that. And if you say something like, oh, don't worry, you'll be better soon, then that, that's kind of almost dismissing what, what they've said. If someone says that to you, take it on board and say, oh, really? Thank you for telling me. Tell me more if you'd like to. Listen to what people say. Doctors, nurses need to listen to what people say. Everyone needs to listen to what people say. The human experience is real and uh, we need to listen to each other's and take it seriously and believe people when they report their feelings. That's what a symptom is by definition. It's something the patient experiences, it's not a clinical sign that you can see like a knee reflex. Symptoms something a patient reports. If a patient reports a symptom, believe it. Unless you've got very firm evidence that it's not true, then we need to believe it. And that's what this study is doing. It's listening to people. And um, one of the indictments of uh, healthcare professionals over the past few years is maybe not quite enough uh, listening. But thank you for listening.